Welcome back to Everard Junction. As you can see, I've been hard at work on the station area over the past month or so, constructing the office block that also houses the station building. I've also been hard at work detailing and bringing the building to the left closer to completion, which is the shops and flats. The focus of this video will be centered around the office block slash station building. But before we get into that, I'll just give you a quick update with where we are on the building to the left, the shops and flats. In the previous video, this building was well under construction, but there was an awful lot of detail and extra bits that I needed to add. I've now done an awful lot of those, and whilst the building is certainly not finished, it's looking a lot more respectable. The purpose of this building is to bear a passing resemblance to a similar building at Ealing Broadway, and whilst I've taken some liberties with its design and placed it in a slightly different orientation, it is roughly speaking, a model of that structure. Starting at the top, I've added a set of railings, which are present on the real building, but only on the back side of it, where the flats are present. Uh, so I've copied that, and I've also added some TV aerials and satellite dishes to give it a bit more of an 80s, 90s feel. Moving down, I've added blinds and curtains to all of the windows in the building on this side, and they're just made from scale model scenery blinds or just random pieces of assorted card in different colours to represent curtains. You can also see under each window there is a ventilation brick, again very common in uh, brick-built UK structures, and the real flats in Ealing Broadway are no exception, with numerous air bricks being present on the back of the structure. I've also added drains and gutters to the building on the back side, on this side with the flats, just like the real thing at Ealing Broadway. If you go around the front where the shops are, there is no apparent drainage, but around the back, that's where all the drainage happens. So although I've done it in my own style, again, it's uh, in keeping with the theme of the real building. The guttering is made from a series of sections from Will's kits and I've bent and glued them together in various positions and orientations to create something that uh, looks half reasonable with regards to building drainage. To make things look a little bit more interesting, some of the drains bend around and change their route and in this case you can see the drain bends around that brick support column and then goes down the back side of it behind the fence. At the end of the building I've done something similar, bending the drains around just to take different routes and try and break the building up and make it look a little bit more exciting as it is quite a sort of brutalist, dull structure. So I'm trying to give it a little bit of personality so it's not all the same all the way along its length. Once again the curtains and blinds being slightly different, all varied, that really helps as well. Down at the bottom of the structure, along the communal walkway, I fitted a fence to the sort of sections between the brick support columns, and once again this is very typical of the real structure at Ealing Broadway. Behind the fence, although it's very difficult to see, there are doors and door frames to provide rear access to what would be some sort of communal stairwell to access the flats above, and also rear access into the shops. Working all the way down the communal walkway on both sides of the support columns and up above, I've added all the various bits of brick detail that's required to make the building look that much more complete. You'll notice that some of these brick pieces don't fit together absolutely perfectly with the sections on the back of the structure here. And that's because the interior of the building is a series of removable cassettes. So I haven't been able to get a perfect butt joint on some of the brick plastic card pieces, but I have got as close as I can. You need to compromise in some areas, and in this case I've compromised on this bit of detail so that I can remove the inner parts of the building and add lighting and perhaps an interior at a later date. Up on the roof of the building we have a small uh, access area. It's basically just sort of like a uh, trap door. There'll probably be a ladder behind that and uh, that's how you would access the roof of the building. Again, the real structure at Ealing Broadway has a, a very simple affair when it comes to roof access. No structure with doors on it or anything like that. It is literally just a hatch similar to what I've done here. I've added another aerial to this just to make things look a little bit more interesting and those are part of the scale model scenery range. 
The roof of the building is made up of a series of very thin strips of plasticard, all glued down and then painted using a sponge with various different shades of grey to create a sort of faded, tired, weathered appearance, but also look as though it's uh, your traditional sort of roof felt. You can also see how a concrete lintel or support runs around the edge of the roof, but it does not run along the back here and that's to uh, again copy the real building and make the drainage look more convincing. So the roof is on a slight fall and rainwater would run down towards the railings, collecting the gutters that then make their way down the building, just like the real thing. Around the front of the building, I've made a little bit more progress with the shop fronts, and you can see I've cut out various different styles of shop there, and I'm now in the early stages of building those up. Looking down the length of the building, you can see how all those small details really bring it to life. It's certainly not finished and it requires a light weathering, but uh, I am quite happy with the progress so far. A quick update with regards to the platforms. These have changed a little bit since the last video. First of all, you can see I'm in the process of adding some uh, line detail, and that will be uh, covered in more detail in the next video. The main thing I've done is lower the height of the platform slightly, and what I mean by that is when I cut these platforms out, I made them about 18 millimeters tall, and that's a height that I've used in the past, and it works well for me. But uh, when I fitted them to this section of the layout, certainly when I was filming things, wrapping things up towards the end of the video, I noticed that perhaps they looked a little bit too high, and it was pointed out in the comments as well. The reason for that is because I forgot that on this section of the layout I applied a 4mm cork bed to the baseboard top across the whole area. Usually I only apply the cork road bed to the track to give it a nice sort of raised profile. It gives you a, a nice ballast shoulder, it looks quite realistic. On this section I forgot to remove the cork when I put the platforms down and that created an excess of 4mm in height. So to sort that out, I removed the platforms from the layout. They're only screwed down, they're not glued or anything like that. So relatively easy to unscrew them. And with them removed, I cut away the cork, which uh, I should have done in the first place, but I forgot. So I cut that away and then that drops the platforms down four millimeters and then 18 millimeters in platform height next to track sitting on four millimeters of cork gives you just about the perfect platform height and you can see in comparison to that class 101 on the left hand side we're about right now in terms of where the platform should be in terms of the uh, running boards of the locos units and rolling stock once i reinstated the platforms i just tidied up the ballast a little bit on the edges and i've also done a little bit of extra weathering to the track and the brickwork as i felt it looked a little bit uh, light and airy in a few places and i wanted to bring things down uh, make them look a little bit more grubby so that they would better complement some of the more modern architecture that we have up here so while these flats are very reminiscent of the ones at Ealing Broadway the station is very different to what you'd find at Ealing Broadway and is actually a representation of Signal Point, a large office block that you would find in Swindon. Once again I've added my own twist, Signal Point is not actually on the station platform and it's several floors higher, but I have made sure that the window style, the height of the sections of bricks and various elements of the building are to scale and copying that real structure. I've then given it the sort of Everard Junction twist and catered it for the limited space that I have on my layout. So I've combined the station into the ground floor similar to what you would find at Swindon but instead of being adjacent to the platform and across a small road it's actually on the platform itself as I don't have enough space. The building also features a station canopy, which it doesn't in real life, and this is taken from Oxford Station. Again, similar sort of area, that's what we're trying to do. We're taking different ideas and different structures from parts of the western region and combining them into sort of one section on this layout. So let's hand over to myself several weeks ago when I started the construction of this building, and uh, I wish I'd known what I was letting myself in for because there's been many late nights since then, and it still isn't finished. But uh, with the stage I've reached now, I'm really motivated to carry on with it and get those last few details sorted out. So to make this particular office block, it's going to take quite a lot of cutting. And I'm certainly not going to do that by hand. I'll be there for the rest of my life trying to make that thing. So we're going to speed things up and use this, which is a Cricut Maker. Now I bought this from Hobbycraft, which is a chain of craft stores in the UK, but they're also available from various other places. 
Compared to cutting things out by hand, it's considerably more accurate and a hell of a lot faster, hence the Super Sprinter logo. And much like a decent boombox from the early 1980s, you can tell it's a good machine because the door has a damper on it. It looks a bit like an inkjet printer that you typically have hooked up to your computer and it has about the same sort of footprint. It doesn't take up a huge amount of space. It also makes about the same amount of noise as an inkjet printer, so it can get a bit irritating when it's doing a job that's going to take several hours. At the business end of the machine you've basically just got two holders for various tools and the one I pretty much always use is the knife blade and this is basically a scalpel like you would use traditionally with a steel rule and steady hand. Instead it's controlled by a motor and it's just quicker, more accurate. In addition to the knife blade it also has this thing which is a fine point blade and I find this is really useful for cutting thin plastic and that's how I make all of the windows. Using the tool holder on the left hand side you can also put a pen in it and do more craft orientated things. To create the main structure and shell of the building I'll be using this heavy chipboard which is made by Cricut for the machine. Now it's probably a little bit more expensive than some other types of card out there but I do really like the quality of it and it's a perfect fit inside the machine as it's obviously made for it. And you can see to cut it you need the knife blade and the Cricut Maker machine. This particular sheet is two millimeters thick and it provides a real nice sturdy base for that building and if you use a little bit of clever design you can make each sheet build quite a large structure. The material goes on these cutting mats, that's this uh, purple sheet that the material is sitting on. These are available in uh, different types depending on what you're doing and they are a consumable, they only last so long before they need to be replaced. This is only the second one I've ever had to use and it's lasted uh, over a year so you can do a lot of work before it needs to be replaced and they're not massively expensive, at least when I bought the last one. With regards to the tools in the machine, they also last a very long time due to the way it works. It only applies a very gentle amount of pressure to the blade. The knife blade is probably the most heavily used tool in my machine. And as you've seen on the layout, I've got the signal box, the block of flats, the office block that we're building now, the nasty flats over the station, and numerous other small projects and buildings here and there. And I've not had to replace the blade. As you can see the cutting mat runs in these guides on the plastic base of the machine and it's pulled in and out by this uh, rubber wheel with a knurled wheel on the bottom of it. Be mindful to keep any debris and bits of material out from these wheels. If anything gets stuck to them the rolling circumference of this wheel will change versus the one on the other side and then over time this sheet will slowly work its way uh, crooked in the machine and you're going to end up with very inaccurate cutting. Also when cutting thick stuff it's a good idea to use a bit of cheap masking tape just to secure the material to the mat, make sure it doesn't move. On this particular material the machine is going to make 25 passes before it actually cuts all the way through this 2mm card. That's how it makes its uh, blades last so long. But in order to do that it needs accurate repeatability of each cut. So it's important that the workpiece doesn't move and that the rollers in the machine are nice and clean and there's, there's no debris in the way. So just keep an eye on it as you're using it. It's not a machine that you can just leave running all afternoon. It does require periodic checking and perhaps pausing so that you can remove a loose bit of material from the machine as it continues to cut through the sheet. The machine's now ready to go and cut out the last bit for the beginnings of the uh, building structure. So let's get that cut out. It will take a while for the machine to break through the 2 mil card, but uh, certainly a lot better than doing it by hand. As you can see by the speed that it works, I would uh, find it impossible to work that quickly. So it's a real time saver in that respect. The 
the blade in this machine has had quite a lot of use and it's built quite a lot of buildings today and it still does a very nice job. I find it now needs all 25 of the recommended passes on 2mm to get through the material but when this blade is brand new and razor sharp I have found in the past that you can pause the machine after 15 to 18 passes and uh, it's already cut through it so just keep an eye on it. As I say it's not the sort of machine you can just leave running unattended it does need just you know a little bit of monitoring here and there so that you don't uh, end up wasting materials. So now comes the uh, satisfying bit. And there you go. Nice and precise, much easier than cutting it by hand. And while I might be able to do that one piece on my own with a steel rule and a sharp knife, I'm certainly not going to make six of them, which is what I've had to do here. So we've gone from some initial sketches on a bit of paper to some design work on the computer, and now we have all the pieces for the first stage cut out. As you can see there's a lot of parts and something I've done as part of the design which I do for all my buildings is designed location tabs so you can see the notches and the slots on the various pieces so that they all lock together and that will just make assembly quite a bit more accurate and it will also give the building a great deal of strength as opposed to just butt jointing bits of card together with some glue you're going to have a little bit of uh, greater surface area with that glue by using location tabs and getting things to slot into place. And as I mentioned, it, it just lines everything up really nicely as well. Nice and square, you know, it's all straight. I use rocket card glue to glue all this stuff together. I use it for lots of jobs on the railway, but certainly when it comes to card and cardboard, it really is good stuff. It dries quickly, and very strong. So that's the base pieces of the building now assembled and glued and you can see it's quite a large structure but all of those separate pieces that all cut out quite intricately fit together really nicely and it creates a very strong sturdy shell that's nice and straight and true when you look down it. The building is slightly taller than these flats over on the left hand side and it's also exactly the same height as the back scene. It's basically as high as I can go due to the roof of the house. So the next thing to do is to work on a little bit of extra structure that's going to go in this corner here and that's going to lead out to the street so that people can access the station itself. And the idea would be that you would enter the station from the street and once you'd gone to the booking office or bought a ticket or whatever you were doing you would come down stairs, escalator, lift, whatever it might be, and then you will arrive on this ground floor here, and that will allow you access to that station platform. Working a little bit further up the platform, past this DMU, there will be, of course, a footbridge of some description, so you can gain access to other platforms. So obviously it's very, very early stages at the moment, and it can look a little bit odd, a little bit strange, a little bit plain, and it's also a big structure, so it makes quite a visual sort of 
difference to the area and you can sort of look at it and go oh not sure about this but uh, experience has taught me that uh, no matter how rubbish uh, some of these early stages can look once you start getting a bit of oh, brick plastic hard a little bit of painting and a little bit of detailing done the building really springs to life and starts to look at home in the spot that you've placed it and again hopefully you can see the the sort of mix of different stations along the western region during the time period so while these flats are very reminiscent of Ealing Broadway including the shops on the other side this building is very very similar to that monstrosity at Swindon and I'm hoping to construct the footbridge in such a way that it's very reminiscent of the one at Oxford station which was new during the time period my layout is set and is a very 80s network southeast looking structure so I think com combining those uh, different aspects of different stations really lend themselves to this tight confined area on the layout where I don't really have the space to build a full size station to scale. So some time has passed and I've continued to make some more bits and pieces for the building. So you can see the office uh, portion of the building has extended into the area on the street and there's now a protruding section below that part of the building which will house the entrance to the station. I've also started to add some of the bits of brick detail to the uh, building, that's the white plastic card that you can see there, and I'm also experimenting with a few ideas with regards to some extra details. So on the real building around the back of it there's a form of stairwell or lift shaft, it's very ugly and it's covered in sort of corrugated uh, material and uh, I think that would be quite a nice addition to the building to break things up. And at the bottom of the building I've also got a few other bits and pieces such as doors and stuff for passengers to get out onto the platforms. There will be a canopy attached to this building in a similar manner to the one at Oxford Station. So once again I'm combining bits and pieces from buildings I've seen in real life in different stations and things like that and then adding my own sort of bits and pieces that I want to do on top of that. So we're not going for an exact copy of the building but you'll certainly see a passing resemblance once it's all finished. On the section of the building over here I'm experimenting with a few different ideas with regards to windows, just doing some slightly different windows to give the effect that the building is uh, owned by the station in that area. So the idea would be that you know, you'd come through this section here and you'd, you'd pass through this bit and go down a lift or walk down some stairs and eventually you'd find your way at these doors. And then the rest of the building is sort of all office space. This section here will be uh, probably a little shop or perhaps a little restaurant or something, you know, quite typical for the time period and even stations today is usually a little cafe or something in various stations. At the ends I've actually uh, bricked up the wall, this will be bricked up completely and uh, I'll be putting some advertising and a few details and things like that. Uh, when you look at stations, certainly on the, uh, the platform, there's actually a large amount of just straight brick wall with you know small you know, access doors and you know, the odd few windows and things but mostly it's all brick and it's covered in uh, advertising information and equipment for the station. Over on this side you can see the entrance to the station itself. I'll be uh, making a separate piece of card with doors and windows and such but you can see the sort of idea there. Very very basic at the moment, barely started but that's the idea. You can also see how the office block actually stops a little bit short and then the station building sort of sticks out a little bit further than that to bring it flush with these shops here. So we've got different heights and different shapes and I think it all just lends itself to uh, make the scene look as interesting as possible while still maintaining this rather nasty architecture and whilst not strictly based on Ealing Broadway it is a little bit of a nod to that station certainly uh, while the station is in the process of being modernized you can see the uh, entrance to Ealing Broadway is a, a similar affair it's uh, very low-key not very uh, nice just sort of you know straight in and down some stairs sort of a job so uh, that's the sort of thing I've tried to do there obviously in the real location these shops are actually on the other side of the road but you know, just trying to make things my own and make things unique but taking things from real life and just using it to uh, give it a flavour and a feel for a particular time and place. Okay so I've made some more progress this is a bit of a monster to work on so it's a little bit tricky to film it at the various stages but I'll do my best. As you can see I've added some more of the brick plastic card and the various uh, extra bits of card to form the ground floor and some other details have now been glued on. So down on the ground floor you can see that I've blanked off some of the walls, added some door detail, a little bit of window detail, and there's the, the small cafe or shop, that will be the uh, ground floor of the station, next to this uh, lift shaft or stairwell, 
and then we've got uh, another brick wall at the end there so I'll be putting various bits of advertising and other small details all over the wall of this building and this little bit here it could even be a, a staff room of sorts some sort of uh, staff only area certainly and you can see at this end I've finished uh, a little bit more of the brick plaster card for the station entrance and then the office above little trick for the corners it can be difficult to get a perfect join on plaster card especially when you're working on a large building that's got lots of different pieces some will go really nicely and others might have a small gap in that case what I do is just fill the corners with a small amount of white filler from deluxe materials and then you can give that a light sanding and it blends the two pieces together. Once that's painted and had a bit of weathering you'll never even know that it's two separate bits of plastic card. This is the stuff, it's the Model Light and it uh, by its name is very light, very delicate, easy to sand but it's perfect for doing those tiny little jobs. And you can see a little bit of it on these joints here. The building is so long I can't get a complete run of plastic card out of one sheet, so butted the pieces as close together as I can, small amount of filler, sand that down, rescribe the mortar course through that filler line, and hopefully once this is all primed and painted, you'll never be able to tell. So I've glued all of this brick plastic card on using uh, Deluxe Materials Rocket Card Glue. I find it sticks the plastic card really nicely to the card. It doesn't come off or anything like that. It seems to be a bit more reliable than using super glue, which I have done in the past. But if something does go wrong and needs to be removed, it is possible to peel it off without damaging the card underneath. As you can see, I've added quite a bit of brick plastic card now, and the stuff I like to use is made by Southeastern Finecast. And this particular building is just the plain bond brick, nothing fancy. I've continued to make little adjustments and slight changes as I tweak and refine the design. Something I've done before priming the building is obviously I've glued all of the plastic card uh, to it and uh, that's just to save a little bit on primer and paint and also what I've done is add some of the lintels, the concrete lintels and trim that go above and below the windows. I've differed slightly from the original structure as the original structure is just so dull so I've um, added a few extra bits of trim here and there uh, to try and make this building look a little bit more exciting than the uh, real one at Swindon. As you can see the various entrances, staff, facilities, shops and blank top walls are all in position as well so I'll go ahead and give this a heavy coat of grey primer that's going to protect the card underneath from uh, moisture and uh, weather and stuff you know in the future it can get quite uh, hot up in the attic and so far priming all of my card building seems to have worked really well. With that complete we'll move on to applying the brick I'll just uh, airbrush the whole building in uh, a nice sort of red brick colour and then we can go ahead and mortar wash all of that. I'll then do a bit of masking and paint the various concrete trims and then we can start looking at adding extra detail and other bits of concrete and trim and facades and signage and all the other stuff that makes this thing come together. Of course we've got to build the windows as well. I've given the building a heavy coat of grey primer just from a spray can and now it's time to paint on some of the red brick. In this case I'll be using the rail match light brick. This is the acrylic variety, sometimes I use enamel, it just depends what I've got. Enamel or acrylic work well for buildings. Obviously the building's quite big and it doesn't fit in my spray booth, so I've brought it outside to make sure that we're safe from any fumes and issues like that. When you're doing any airbrushing, whether it's enamel or acrylic, always try and look after yourself. Make sure you've got some way of getting rid of the fumes. So I've given it about four or five coats of the rail match light brick. 
I'll leave that out here in the sun for an hour or two to dry. Acrylic paint's great to work with because it dries so quickly. So in a couple of hours, we should be able to uh, get the mortar wash out and start uh, making this building look a bit more realistic. So I'm now in the process of mortar washing all of these brick sections. This is an incredibly dull and tedious process, but it makes a massive difference to the appearance of the building. Okay, so I have successfully managed to mortar wash the entire building. You've seen this on the channel a lot of times before. I mix up a very thinned uh, mix of uh, sort of beige off-white paint to represent the mortar. That's just uh, a mix of Vallejo paints, and then I just pour that into a spare container, and I just keep it, keep it topped up and add to it every time it runs low. A load of cotton buds, you'll need quite a few of those and then just some acrylic thinner on those cotton buds and just very gently scrape away at the uh, surface and you'll rub off the excess mortar wash after it's been brushed on and it'll expose the red brick underneath. When you use this method, it's a good idea when you're airbrushing on the brick, whether you're using acrylic or enamel, to do lots of coats. Try and do two more coats than what you were planning on because you will inevitably rub some of those off. You can see all of these have a sort of reddish tinge to them as some of the paint from the brick will always come off the surface and that's regardless of using enamel or acrylic. I've also got some of this corrugated sheet. This is from Wills, which is a brand of Pico, I believe. I've had this in stock for ages, and I'm contemplating using that on the stairwell or lift shaft. The real building in Swindon has something similar, and it certainly serves its purpose of making the building look more disgusting. So I'm thinking of doing that, but uh, I might change it. I might do something else. I might just go for a, uh, a render sort of finish. Not sure yet. So that's those concrete lintels now all painted. They're really starting to bring the building to life now. It certainly screams 1969, and you could imagine it featuring one of those old black and white films from the 60s with the classic voiceover bloke going, it's out with the old and in with the new at this modern high-rise office building and station at Everard Junction. So just looking at this stairwell or lift shaft at the back of the real building in Swindon, um, you can see it's a little bit different, it's got windows and stuff in it, but uh, what I want to do is replicate the, uh, the corrugated finish because it's uh, mm, nice. So uh, I've been looking at different uh, bits and pieces I've got in stock. This is from Wills, made by Pico, and it's good in the sense that it's got the the sort of little protrusions for these screws that would be holding it onto the building and you can see some overlap detail there as well but I always felt that this was a bit chunky it's a bit over scale in its appearance and that's why I've never really used it very much on the other hand I have this from Goodwood Scenics and I've got some of this left over from a previous project this is aluminium and you can see it's been pressed into a sort of corrugated shape very thin very fragile but it's much finer in its appearance, as you can see, compared to the Wills plastic sheet. I think this is actually going to look better, even though it's missing the screw detail. So I'll cut some pieces of this up or lay it on to this part of the building here and see how it looks. Definitely want a different material here, otherwise it's going to be much too uh, heavy on the old uh, bricks. 
So uh, this will break things up quite nicely. It's the main reason I put this shaft in in the first place is to, uh, to break the building up. I've glued some sections of that corrugated aluminium onto the building in a similar style to how the real one is at Swindon and I've just given that a quick shot of grey primer. I will go over it with some other paints to get some variation in the tones but I'm quite happy with that so far. Certainly a good start and it provides a nice bit of contrast, it's not all just brick. So now I'll turn my attention to one of the most tedious and boring parts of most of these projects and that is the sheer number of windows. As you can see I've made a start on these ones and they are brick for brick exactly the same size as the ones on the real building at Swindon and it's just nice to know because it can be difficult to uh, gauge the size of certain bits and pieces but I was able to work out the size of the real windows so I've copied that and then using that uh, that window size I've been able to sort of scale the various floors and everything so the building uh, with regards to the distance between each floor, height of the windows and the height of the brick courses and things like that is all the same as the building in Swindon. To make the windows once again I use the Cricut Maker and some regular white plasticard. I tend not to paint them as the white plasticard does a pretty good job of representing the sort of plasticky PVC finish that you often find windows in. Cutting the windows out is a bit tricky. The frame for the window is only one mil thick. It's quite thin plastic card, so you know the pieces tend to uh, sort of come out uh, whilst they're being cut. So I always cut more than I need because you are always going to get a few failures. You can see this one here got ripped up by the machine as it was cutting the rest of them, but the majority of them are okay. So I'll pop those out and we can start assembling the rest of the windows. I can adjust the settings on the machine so it doesn't cut as many times or uses less pressure but then it doesn't cut completely through the plastic and I'm stuck cutting everything out manually with a knife at the end. So I still prefer to go down this route, you just get one or two failures every now and again but the easiness of just being able to pop the windows out of the sheet and get them straight onto the projects and start using them is much better than sitting there with a steel rule and a knife. Each window is made of a pair of these two frames, one at the front a layer of glazing and then one at the back so you get quite a rigid structure when you're finished and then it just pops neatly into the space that was previously cut out in the cardboard frame of the building. You can also see I've put some black uh, sort of fascia boards, some facade type boards on the bits between each section of window. In real life these are the concrete pillars that support the building and very typically what they used to do with a lot of these horrible structures was just cover that in something that looked a little bit like a window if you squinted so the, the architectural idea was that it looked like the windows continued right the way across the building and there were no dividing walls when actually the whole thing was riddled with concrete pillars and just bits of trim to try and cover up the fact that it was actually quite a basic structure. On their own I think they uh, look okay but they're a little bit lifeless, a little bit bland, they need some sort of personality and some life adding to them and to achieve that what I did with the apartment blocks around the other side of the station and a few other buildings is add curtains and blinds and that makes a huge difference to the appearance of the building. As this is an office block I'm just going to be going with blinds and you can see that I'm using a kit from Scale Model Scenery. These are laser cut and extremely effective because light can pass through the individual slats of the blinds. They are not a solid piece of material. Very very effective and you can see there's various uh, versions of them. Some at jaunty angles, some fully drawn, some in different positions and stuff. So you can get a nice bit of variety. And then we have some of them installed. I basically cut the various sections of the kit out and adapt them, cut them down, trim them, do whatever to join them together into a section that is appropriate for this particular building and you can see how I've glued a section of four blinds together there so that the idea is you've got one blind per pane of glass which is what you'd probably find in real life or you might have say one blind per two panes of glass, it doesn't really matter. So you can see there's the effect. Once that's got some lighting in it, the light's going to shine through the slats of those blinds and you're also still going to be able to catch a glimpse into the building there, as you can see by the uh, fact that the blinds are not fully closed. This is going to be a lengthy process, but I will do my best to try and get as many installed by the end of this video. I'll go around the building and sort of cut and adapt that kit to uh, have some blinds fully open, some fully drawn, and we'll get real variation on each section of the building. And it's just going to help break things up a little bit. 
I've also been busy working on some signage and advertising for the station. This is always a little bit of a challenge, especially if you're modelling the past, as it can be hard to find the right sort of adverts in the right sizes and things like that. Most of what survives from older advertising, certainly 30, 40 years ago, is going to be things out of magazines, things that are still in people's hands that have been left in an attic or something and then years later when the nostalgia kicks in these adverts uh, surface online and you know people share those memories what people never did and what people still don't do because why would you is take a photograph of a billboard in a public place those adverts are usually quite a bit different in terms of the amount of text that they contain and the size of them but it can be quite hard to actually find pictures of them. Usually the pictures you do find are just incidental. The photograph is covering something else and there just so happens to be a billboard in the background. So it can be quite a challenge to find high quality, decent images. So I spend quite a bit of time over the uh, years working on the layout, just every now and again, looking around for period advertising. Most of the signage I end up making myself using Photoshop and uh, sometimes a few other applications like Publisher and things like that. So the Everard Junction station signs, that is a King's Cross station sign that I managed to find a decent image of and then I doctored it in Photoshop and edited it all about to create the Everard Junction sign. And you can see this uh, wimpy shop front over here. While it's relatively easy to find the wimpy logo, it's almost impossible to find a decent photograph of a old school wimpy shop front because again, nobody took a picture of it. So using a blurry picture of one in the back I've managed to get quite close to what the uh, shop front would have looked like. And then over on the station building itself you can see the sort of thing we're going to go for with terms of the arrangement. And I've tried to get a bit of a spread of different advertising, so you can see we've got some uh, period films there, um, Absolute Vodka, Qantas Airlines, obviously the Everard Junction station sign. I've tried to keep all the advertising within the 1988 to 1990 bracket, although there may be one or two exceptions if it's a particularly good image or if it's a you know an advert that looks quite good in terms of colour and things like that. Moving a bit further along, we have the Wimpy. I was going to do a Casey Jones, but about 967 people said in the previous video that I should have a Wimpy, so thank you, those 967 people who all wrote their own separate comment. There's a Wimpy for you. Some more signage and bits and pieces. This will all get weathered. You can see it's all quite glossy and shiny at the moment. It will get toned down. There's the sort of main entrance to the station and I've copied the uh, sort of entrance and exit at Oxford Station. So you've got double doors leading out and another set of double doors leading in. There's another ad just there advertising the Network South East rail card. It's been about a week since the last clip and I've been slowly chipping away at the building over the course of a few evenings when I've got a spare hour. Building all of these windows has been very time consuming despite the uh, Cricut machine obviously uh, cutting it all out. You've still got to glue it all together so it has taken quite a while. You can see I've also fitted blinds to most of the windows, making sure each blind is in a slightly different position for each pane. Just gives a bit of variation, really brings the building to life and gives it that sort of lived in appearance or worked in appearance. And certainly once I've added lighting to the building and certain windows are lit up, I think it'll look really effective. Over on the flats, I've done a mixture of blinds and curtains. Obviously on the office building, it's a commercial place, so it's pretty much all blinds. But regardless of what you do, it certainly makes the windows look a lot more effective than just a plain piece of glass. I'm going to keep going with the details. Obviously the building needs some weathering as well. It does have a lighter tone of brick to its surroundings, being a sort of more modern structure. And uh, at the moment it certainly looks a little bit too uh, clean and clinical. So there'll be some weathering and stuff added to it. But uh, the next job I think I'm going to start looking at is the station canopy. You can see the gap where that would be fitted to the building. And the canopy is going to be based uh, off of the uh, canopy that you would find at Oxford Station. Uh, so nothing particularly uh, inspiring to look at, but it will really blend in with the very urban surroundings that we've got here. I'll also continue to work on the roof of the building. That needs extra concrete trim work uh, placing around it. I would have liked to make the roof a little bit taller, but this really is the limit of the back scene and the house. So you've got to work with the limitations that you have. In real life, this building is a lot taller and the idea would be that in model, the uh, building is a lot taller as well. Uh, so I'll do something nice to square and finish all of that off. But uh, if I do make it any taller, it's going to be higher than the back scene for the layout, which will look a little bit strange. You can also see how effective the sort of platform advertising and signage sort of works. 
along with any uh, sort of health and safety notices and indeed uh, any stores such as the Wimpy so uh, lots more bits and pieces to add I've got a few 3D printed bits and pieces as well to give a little bit of extra detail to these walls but uh, I'm quite pleased with how that's come out and certainly with a little bit of toning down I think it will look quite effective I think in the last clip I said something about building the canopy uh, as you can see I have started constructing that it's just made of card again I've cut that out on the uh, Cricut Maker Hopefully you can see on the cross supports in there I've got a slight sort of dip in the centre of the canopy that's copied from the real thing at Oxford Station and I'll be running a drain uh, down there so that you can uh, sort of portray uh, where the rainwater would go. Looking at the canopy at Oxford it looks as though those drains then root internally through the support columns that hold the canopy up. I've ordered some more corrugated uh, aluminium from Goodwood Scenics, uh, quite expensive stuff but uh, it does look good, I'm really pleased with how it appears on the sort of stairwell slash lift shaft so I'll be uh, doing the same thing on the canopy. On top of the building I've done the same as what I did for the flats and that's to glue some very thin pieces of plastic card to the roof to resemble a sort of roof felt finish and I'll paint those the appropriate colours. I have used paper in the past to do this but I was really pleased with how it came out on the flats so I decided to do it again for this structure. So it's another late night working on the building but I'm really pleased with how it's starting to look. I've done lots of little bits and pieces since the last few clips. I've made sure all of the concrete lintels around the windows are all fully painted inside and out so there's no uh, bits of raw material showing. Even on the black pieces of trim that surround the support columns I've made sure the black extends all the way around so where the windows are fitted everything is painted where it should be. All of the windows have been straightened up and glued into position. That took flipping ages, but uh, certainly worth the effort. And I've also added some concrete trim around the top of the building just to finish it off. That's still in the process of being painted. At the end of the building, I've also extended the various black facades and brickwork around the corner in that true sort of 1969 style. I've made some more progress since the last clip and the building is now back on the layout again just trying out a few things making sure everything still fits so the main thing that I've done is at the base of the building I've drawn around the edge of the footprint for the building and then I have scraped off any excess grout on the platform back to the bare plywood that's underneath so as you can see by doing that the building has the appearance of having a foundation it's now sunk into the uh, platform by about one brick or so and that does two things it makes the building look more realistic and it also helps hide that cardboard base layer that the bottom of the building has inside it for the needs of strength and rigidity so i'm really pleased with how that's come out as you can see by giving a building a foundation it always looks a lot better and that's something i try to do on all the uh, various bits of building work on the layout so uh, pleased with that I've also done some weathering, it might be hard to tell on camera, I don't want to make this thing too filthy. Large buildings like this always have a bit of staining and a bit of muck, but they're never absolutely filthy. But hopefully you can see, certainly on the concrete lintels, there's some staining and things from the sort of rainwater and dirt. And you can see also all the black uh, facades that sort of separate the windows out. They've all got a bit more of a faded appearance now. To achieve that I've used the Humbrol Weathering Master which is just a weathering powder set. Very easy to use, you've seen it on the channel several times before and I've just gone over the whole building using the Weathering Master with a soft paintbrush and some cotton buds. I didn't mask up the windows or anything, I've gone over them with that weathering powder as well. So we have a very slight bit of weathering powder on the window frames and you can see the glass isn't perfect. There's no fingerprints or anything like that but you can see uh, smudges and staining and dirt uh, just like the real building would have. The windows wouldn't be absolutely perfect. And then moving across the roof of the building hopefully you can see the addition of the concrete capping that just finishes the roof off. I raised the roof of the building very slightly to achieve this and I've used two different strips of plasticard from Evergreen and then painted those in the appropriate colours and you can see how that sort of really just you know, tidies things up and just squares the edge of the roof off. And for the roof of the building itself you can see I've now painted some of that roofing felt and while it needs weathering it's certainly looking quite a bit more respectable. The same goes for the station entrance around the front, which of course still needs quite a bit of work doing to it, but uh, I will get round to that in due course.
I also need to add a little bit more fence, drainage and some other details to the protrusion, the sort of pod that forms the entrance to the station. It looks like a real afterthought as if it was extended at some point during its life and that's just what I'm going for. Something that doesn't really look like it should belong there as a lot of bits of these sort of buildings tend to get modernised and fiddled with over the years and they end up looking even worse than they did when they were built originally. Around the back of the building you can see I've been busy, you can see each floor is subdivided and then I've got a section of card that blocks off the uh, whole rear section here so you can't see through the windows and look at the back scene. So it darkens each sort of section, each cell down quite nicely and of course you can see I've added a selection of LEDs to various floors. I've made sure about 50% of the building is lit and then the other 50% will be in darkness so it should look quite authentic in a night scene with some of the building lit up and some of it not. As you can see in this section of the building, I've hidden most of the wiring in the, the sort of stairwell lift shaft area and that's uh, running through a couple of pieces of brass rod which basically form a bus bar and then each pair of wires from each LED can just uh, work their way through the various walls of the building and terminate in here out of sight and that means there's only two wires to power up the entire building so I haven't got to put loads of holes in the station platform. At the base of the building you can see the uh, brass rod comes out the top just there with two wires so it's nice and easy to uh, put it onto the layout. It's only two holes and two wires that need to run down through the baseboard and uh, the uh, bits of brass rod just make uh, wiring up each uh, LED a little bit easier with all the wiring working its way through the various walls of the building. I've added a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor just to bring the brightness of the LEDs down a little bit. Everything's wired in parallel and they do have a resistor uh, with them, a little surface mount one. I'm not sure exactly what the value is, but as per most lighting in the hobby, I always find it to be too bright. So much like uh, rolling stock, locomotives and buildings, I've made sure uh, the brightness is toned down as per all the other stuff I have. Okay, so that's the building back onto the layout. I've just run the wires through two holes in the platform and that's uh, connected to a temporary power supply. In a future video, I'll go into detail about how I'm powering these lights. At the moment, it's all just temporary, but as I get the flats on the left illuminated and get some lighting underneath the uh, sort of raised area underneath here and platform lighting and so forth, there will need to be a proper bus wire for powering all the various lighting accessories. This camera doesn't do so well in low light conditions, but hopefully you can get an idea for how things look. Get the idea there, it's quite a gentle sort of layer of lighting. You can see how effective the blinds look. I'll overlay a couple more pictures that I took on my phone, which look a lot closer to how you can see it with the naked eye. You can see it's a bit brighter there, and that's uh, certainly much more how it appears to me up here in the room. So uh, still lots to do obviously with the building, but uh, I think we'll leave it there. It's been uh, quite a lengthy process spanning several weeks to get this structure completed and we're still not really completed yet. There's still quite a bit of extra stuff to do. The plan is to uh, start looking at the platforms, work on that building a little bit more in the background, get that canopy finished. But uh, now we need surrounding detail to help complement these two buildings. And uh, in the same train of thought, those two buildings should really complement any scenery I now do on the platforms and towards the front of the layout and provide a nice backdrop for what I'm trying to do. I'll also be turning my attention to a footbridge inspired by the one at Oxford Station and that might be at the end of this building, it might be in a slightly different location but there will be a decent sized footbridge going across to all of the platforms. So I hope you enjoyed it, perhaps picked up a couple of hints and tips and ideas. That Cricut Maker machine is really useful and certainly allows me to build much more ambitious structures than I would other otherwise contemplate. You can imagine how long this perhaps would have taken if I was to cut everything out by hand. So I uh, thoroughly recommend that machine. I'm not in any way affiliated or in uh, Cricut's uh, pocket. I've had that machine for about three years. I think I paid just over 300 pounds for it at the time. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, certainly worth the money in the amount of time it saved me. And uh, incidentally, obviously I'm not uh, affiliated with any of the other bits and pieces that you see on the layout. Everything is bought and paid for, unless I say otherwise. So. Uh, if you see something that I recommend, I genuinely do recommend it. A good example of that is these scale model scenery blinds. Really effective, provide a nice lived in or worked in appearance to the windows of the building 
and uh, I pay for those just like any other customer. So thanks again for watching and I'll be back as soon as I can with some more progress on the station area and I'll try and get some more shots of trains running in future. Obviously this video is a bit of an exception with so much uh, time and energy being focused on just building that one structure.